Okay, so let me see. I had two miscellaneous announcements. Number one, Web Development Club. Um, there you go. They have a lot of work ahead of them. That is Monday, 2 to 3 p.m. right here. No, this is 2.54, isn't it? In the lab is 2.51. Uh, so even uh, they encourage even the 111 students in there. Uh, let me see, how's he marketing this? Lab and club for you to practice, improve all aspects, learn about web design. Uh, so if you want to get a web presence, haven't done anything with the web, it might be uh, good to hang out there with those folks. So the Web Development Club. And the other announcement is for folks seeking additional help. I've got a link on Blackboard that I think is like help with C++, something like that on that left pane there. And I will add this information there as well. Uh, but there is uh, a free tutor in the Student Learning Center. In the Student Learning Center, room 340. Uh, go to, to find out for more info. You want to go to www.csuchico.edu Student Learning Center, and they should have uh, information on the tutor, who incidentally is also one of your graders. Um, and he's, he's been doing it for a few semesters now, so uh, he will be very intimately aware of the kinds of things that you're doing here. Uh, again, the, the tutor information, I'll go ahead and, and, and post to that help with C++ link in the course shell. Okay, uh, so I, I have things to talk about today. I have posted assignment three, so I'll talk a little bit about some of the subject matter we need for that. Uh, prior to that, does anyone have any questions for me? Yes? When you're in the terminal, how do you move up to the parent directory? Yes. Okay, so I am currently I am in the users T Gibson Chico courses 111s14 this directory. If I want to get up into the parent directory right here, I do cd space and then dot dot is always the parent directory. Uh, dot means the current directory, so cd dot means moving to the current directory, which does nothing. So it's meaningless with cd. Where it becomes useful is uh, things like I want to copy uh, from host from id at host colon some directory, and I want to copy that from that machine to my current directory. That's an example of where that's useful. That's all right. That's all right. Yes. That the dot by itself means the current directory. That's exactly what it means, yeah. And that's why it's being put there. So when you see the dot there, there's nothing about secure copy that says that. I could, if I were inclined, let me bring it up this way. I could have said, um, take this. I could have said copy it into users, T Gibson, downloads, or something like that. Uh, so all it's expecting for this third argument, or for the second argument, is where you want to put it. And certainly it's quite common just to throw it into your current directory. Okay, so that's where that's coming from. Does three dots mean anything? Um, no, three dots doesn't. Although uh, it, that, that brings up a different subtopic, which is worth spending about 60 seconds on. So there are, in your... Let me just go to Jaguar, SSH, Jaguar. Ah, hang on. And it doesn't like that because 
what I need to do is I need to go here. Oh, it's letting me do that. All right, now let me see if it'll do it. There we go. All right, just had a delay. I thought I needed to authenticate. Okay, so uh, if I if I do it, uh, you can. It looks like my closet. Um, I won't make any excuses. A lot of junk in my Jaguar account. Uh, but if I do a minus A, that means see all files. It turns out the list is quite a bit larger. And what I want to focus on is that there are a number of direct here directories and files that begin with a period, and these are called hidden files. Okay, they're not secret because everyone who knows anything about Linux or Unix knows that they're hidden files. They're literally just to keep them out of eyesight for when you're doing normal directory listings because you normally don't care about them or need to see them. Uh, many of them are sitting in your home directory and they contain configuration information. So when you ran bin T. Gibson helper that first time, what I was doing is I was dumping some information into a couple of these files to help get your environment set up the way I thought it needed to be set up. Uh, so if I go here, here to uh, CD. All right. uh, if I do a minus A here, there are actually three quote unquote files. There's this announce that I just created, and there are two more your current directory, something that represents your current directory, and something that represents your parent directory. You normally don't see them because they get begin with a period. Can you create a file that begins with a period? Yes. I'll create .fdsa. I'll put hi there in it. And when I do an ls, there's nothing there. But with the magic of the dash a option to see all files, and I'm too low, I apologize. Let me do that. Uh, there you see the file with a listing to see everything. Okay. Your question was, well, does dot, dot, dot mean anything? What it means is that you're creating a file called dot, dot, dot. And you normally won't see it. Why? Because it begins with a period. If I do a dash A, then there's my dot 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 file. It's just a normal file when I create it like that. Yes? What's the difference between the copy and secure copy? Uh, the difference between copy and secure copy, uh, copy is intended just to uh, create duplicates of files inside on within a single file system or, or your machine, right? So if you need a copy of a file, that's sitting on your laptop and put a copy of it in a different part of your laptop, that's what you'd use it for. Secure copy will work that way, uh, just in, for the sake of being fully featured. However, the intention of secure copy is to copy across machines on a network. Uh, it used to be, back in the day when I first started, it was called remote copy. And it uh, and that does what we're using secure copy for. Remote copy, however, wasn't secure, which means that nowadays, you know, there's the paranoia about security and all this kind of stuff. So secure copy is actually secure in the sense that it's scrambling up the information as it goes across the network. So if anyone happens to eavesdrop and look at that information going, they will just see garbage. Back in the old days when you used RCP, if I sent my secret password text file across every, anyone who is able to kind of eavesdrop would be able to see that uh, in plain text. So that's something you didn't ask about that I just shared with you because it's part of me. They could still decrypt it, couldn't they? Uh, they could still decrypt it. Um, in principle, they could. The, the security protocols are pretty clever nowadays. And so it would take a, a lot of machine power in many, many years. And by that time, you probably would have moved on. Yes? A uh, quick way to clear the screen. If you're on a Mac, what you see me doing when I do that is uh, it just so happens that the Macintosh, this, so this is Mac specific, uh, you can do, well, it's in here somewhere. I don't have to find it. It's uh, Command K. It's in, it's in edit. It's in edit. All right. Uh, yeah. And, and this has the, what I'm, note that what it's doing. So I've got a scroll bar here, and I can move the scroll bar. When I'm doing Command K, that's actually killing the entire scroll buffer as well. The Linux command slash Unix command is clear. 
And if you just type clear, it'll clear the screen. Note that, that clear does not affect the terminal at all and that I still have my s previous stuff here. You can see that I typed clear a couple times there. Okay. Uh, so yeah, that generally clears what you want. So on Linux, it's not going to destroy all your Mac stuff. It's just going to destroy the page you're looking at. Uh, clear, yeah, clear is just going to clear the screen. And, and destroy is, is such a strong word. Uh, it slows down. It, right, the, the only purpose for this buffer is a convenient way for you to see what you did in the past or if a whole bunch of errors when you compile spin off the screen, you can use the scroll bar to see uh, what that information was. Um, yeah, so that it's that buffer. It's a property of, of this little program running right here, not a, a property of this shell. Uh, that command K is affecting, and clear is not affecting uh, it either. Yes? Um, when you're in the bin editor, I noticed that you were able to delete a whole phrase at a time. Uh, and when I'm in Vim, I'm able to delete a whole phrase at a time. Yes, if I bring up some code, uh, there there is a command. So Vim command is, there's a a couple more that I've introduced to one of the labs, probably not both. D means delete, uh, C means change, and what the the format is, let me put it here, is command direct uh, movement. Okay, so all you have to do is either a D or a C and then some other command that actually moves the cursor. So the, the real easy thing that we already know is that L moves this way and H moves this way, right? So I can say D L and it removes that O that I'm sitting on. Uh, it, there are a lot of, of useful movement commands. The one that I'm, you're probably seeing me use, so let me say movement is W, move a word. So if I'm sitting here, every W, 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 so you see it's advancing one word, and it defines a word as uh, if I have uh, punctuation in the middle of a word, it considers that a discrete word. So W, W, W. Uh, anyway, I can combine that with these. So I probably am doing a lot of this stuff. I want to change this, so I say CW. That basically removes all of that and puts me in insert mode. Uh, its close cousin is DW, DW. It also removes that, but it leaves me in command mode. It doesn't put me in insert mode. On, on my computer, the, the arrow keys work to move around in Vim. On your computer, the arrow keys work to move around Vim. Yes, by default, the arrow keys are enabled. They aren't working for me, Todd. That's because I disabled them. Because <laughs> I'm mean. Uh, the, the, and it's for the exact same reason for why I threw you into Vim in the first place, okay? By the time your hand does this to move down to the arrow keys, I've completed the command. That's what I'm trying to get you is to be as good as me, right? If you'd never learn, if you find that those arrow keys don't work, so you just stop using them, and after a couple days you get used to the H's and the L's and the J's and the K's, there's no need to use the arrow keys. It, it'll be in muscle memory, and you don't... I, you know, that's that's like a trip to the Grand Canyon and back. You don't want to do that. All right. So as uh, your parents tell you when they put this yucky slop on your dinner plate, it's for your own good. Are there any other quick questions? All right. Yes? So are we allowed to resubmit code even though like, it was through yesterday? Like we corrected a mistake? Uh, can you resubmit corrected code? Um, it depends. So all of the assignments, I there's a little setting that I can do when I create those in the course shell. There's a setting that I say unlimited submissions. So you can be resubmitting all day long, and all I do is I just grab the most recent one you submitted. However, there is a, a cutoff for when it's due, and you're not allowed to submit after that point. Uh, also, you will notice that uh, they all have a due date on them, due, and they're typically usually around like 11.59 at night or something. Uh, I get a lot of issues with people, and I think I mentioned this early on, 
submitting five or ten minutes late and they're worried about that. So what I there's actually two settings. One for when it's due and the second setting is when I suddenly make that whole thing invisible so you can't submit anything any longer. That difference is measured in hours and I don't look to see if you turned it in late. So even though it says due date 11.59, if you turn it in at 2 in the morning, you're good. All right. Uh, and so I'm just giving you a multi-hour window there uh, in case that there's any last-minute issues. Yes? Can you move backwards a word? Uh, backwards a word is um, B. Yeah. <laughs> the magic word. Okay, the magic word for today's lecture is... Puerile, childishly silly and trivial. All you need is this word, right? Don't, don't give me the definition. <laughs> for assignment two, what if we accidentally sent you the executable instead? If in assignment two you accidentally sent me the executable, then email me the source code. Yes, and so let me make that clear. Whenever you all are submitting assignments, I do not want the executable. Okay, Anything that's machine readable, I do not want. I want stuff that's human readable. Will we get docked for that? We get docked for it. No, what happens is uh, if you do it by accident, the grader says, uh, you gave me an executable, I can't grade it, see your instructor. And when you see me, I say email it to me. And then I just grade it. Other questions? All right. Okay, so what I will do is I will take that stuff and I will write that out to vim commands.txt and so that will be uploaded with today's daily diatribe. Uh, this stuff I don't, I'll use this for other things. What did I call that code? Let me move code to conditionals.cpp. All right. Uh, and let me copy that. And I'll create a When you do that, does it actually overwrite the name of the file, or does it create a new file so you still have the old code? Uh, you're asking about this one? Mm -hmm. So the, the version of move I'm using here is uh, analogous to a rename. So I'm just renaming the file. Okay. Yes? Um, is there a button to undo a command up there uh, like you just did in the last command in Vim? In Vim, is there an undo? Like if I can in um, command run up that view and hold it disappears. OK, yes. So uh, yeah, that's a good one. OK. Um, Vim miscellaneous. You undo. And it's it, it only lasts until I exit out of Vim. Once I exit out of Vim, my undo history, if you will, goes away. However, this is recursive, right? So if I'm actually sitting in here for an hour doing thousands of changes, I can just hold down that U key, and it'll go through all thousand of them, all the way back to the beginning. And to go back is Control-R to redo. So here I'll try it. U, 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 U. And then it eventually says already at oldest changes. Now I can do control R, 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 R. And back to where I am. So what's the An example, here I'm going to type a lowercase, I'm on this line here, if I type a lowercase o, note that I'm now in insert mode. 
Uh, if you need a line above where you're at, it's an uppercase O. I'm in, again, I'm in insert mode. So these are variants on how to get into insert mode different ways. So we know I, A, lower and uppercase O. Uh, also C, W, C whatever is going to get us into insert mode as well. All right. Any other questions? Hey, let's go. Okay, and just want that shorter. Uh, we want to start with oh, let's cop copying conditionals. I want to make a copy of this file. I'm going to call this uh, block. So I want to talk a minute about curly braces. <clears throat> right now, the one place where we always see curly braces is at defining, in essence, the beginning and the end of the main function. And I talked uh, a little bit about functions a couple class meetings ago. I forget what got me going down that path. It was a little bit... I probably shouldn't have because really I, I saw people starting to shove functions into assignment two and that really wasn't my intention there. So it's a bit of a faux pas, kind of like the faux pas when you're going on a first date and you reveal that you go to the web development club. Um, but having made that faux pas, let me make the generic statement that whenever you're writing functions, a function always, you have kind of, this is called the signature here. Hello, stop that. This one line is called the function signature. Again, I'm gonna be talking about functions down the road. This is the body of the function. So the body of the function is delineated by an open and a closing curly brace, okay? That's one situation where you're gonna see uh, curly braces. I don't want to talk about that anymore. That, what I want to talk about is everywhere else you can use curly braces. And you can use a curly brace anywhere that you are allowed to put a single statement. So let me put a single statement here. See out, hi there. Uh, so if I want to, I can put curly braces. Basically, you can put single statements inside the body of this function, right? That means anywhere you can put a single statement, you can put curly braces. Now, you may be saying why, and I'll get to that in a moment, but I just want to make it clear. Whoops, I have that backward, don't I? Let me try that again. There we go. So, here I've taken any a statement, and I've surrounded it with curly braces. I'm just doing it to show off, to show you that I can do that. Let me compile it to test, make sure that I'm not lying to you. I am lying to you. Uh, it's complaining about my uh, a warning about this function. I'm going to comment that out since, since I'm not really concerned about that. Again, I just created a dot out. And there's hi there, OK? So these curly braces aren't doing anything useful, but I'm just showing off that wherever I can put a single statement, I can put curly braces. And of course, you can have many, many statements inside of a set of curly braces. I can put some in here, right? Because following what I said, you can put curly braces anywhere you can put a statement. We'll just compile that run it. And hi there, by there, wowzers. Yes? Is there a way to dictate order of operations, or is it just first to the first uh, As far as dictating the order of operations, meaning the way, I ha the way we understand this now is it's going to do, it's basically going to run line 7, then line 8, and then line 10. Uh, yes, there are ways of changing that. Um, we don't have to get into it, I was just wondering. Well, yeah, it, it, yes, there's no magical way for me to say suddenly I want to run this in reverse order where I run 10 first, then 8 first, then 7 first. But there are constructs in the language to allow me to, to decide whether or not to execute something. In fact, that's part of today's discussion. Right? Uh, 
So I just wanted to provide that background that you can use uh, these curly braces anywhere you can use a single statement. And what, I w what you call this is, there are two terms for this. I would either call this a compound statement or I would call it a block. I would say those are syn synonymous terms. Use of curly braces. Yes. Do you have to have a space before and after the chevrons, whatever those little? Uh, uh, the chevrons for this. Do you have to have the space? No, nope, you can cram it all together if you want, or you can put them on different lines. Okay, any of that's fine. The language is very forgiving with with uh, what's called white space. The primary use of white space is to make it more readable for us humans. The machine doesn't care. The other thing, I, I, I'll go ahead and make this as a side statement as well. Uh, C out is fairly flexible in its use. So here I'm printing out high there and then end line. And then I have by there then end line. There's nothing that says those have to be two separate C out statements. I can chain them all together if I want. C out, high there, end line, by there, end line, right? That works just fine. Or I could do use a separate C out statement for every one of these. C out high there, C out end line, C out by there, C out end line. Okay? Yes? So you're saying you put the uh, curly braces in? So far I haven't given you a use for them, but okay. you can put them anywhere. Okay. But if you do that C line, it only, or that C out, it only extends to the end of the line. Oh, you want to see what this does? Yeah, so you can't go past that line and have it carry on to like, if it goes to the lowest. Well, let's, let's find out. So it works just the way it did before. Uh, what, what this is showing you is that END, that, that what this is referred to as an output stream, a stream as in a brook or a river. Okay, meaning that there's just stuff that's going down it, if you will. So hi there is just some text that's going down the output stream. End line, there's nothing magical about end line. It doesn't mean the end of anything in the context of this output stream. It's just another character going down the output stream that happens to visually put us on a new line in the output. But as far as Seattle is concerned, that's just another character in the stream coming. And so that's why this has no significance with re relative to putting all this stuff together on the same statement. Yes? Uh, what's the difference between the double uh, backslash and the double uh, backslash and asterisk? Uh, okay, so these would be forward slashes and not backslashes. The question is, what is the difference between the two forward slashes and the version you've seen that looks like this, maybe? Uh, this is a type of comment that exists only in the C++ language and what that means is from this point in time to the end of the line is a comment and the compiler will totally ignore it right including things like compiler you are stupid and it, it won't even it won't even give a fuss right? uh, and, and you normally do it you, you normally use this for smaller inline comments like a equals B, excuse me, A equals B plus C, and then I want to annotate it so I remember it six months down the road. Um, add Bob's age to Cindy's age and assign to A. I don't, I don't know. Something that's informative to you, yeah? So again, all this is code that's interpreted. As soon as it see, the compiler sees these, then it means from this point to the end of the line you ignore it. This comment structure came from the C language, C++, it's perfectly legal, uh, but it originated in the C language, and this is a multi-line comment. Let me give that. And what that means is as soon as it sees the, this, and again, I can have something like A equals B plus C, but as soon as it sees this, it's a multi-line comment, and it will ignore everything, no matter what you type, until it sees an asterisk slash. Kind of like the curly braces, yeah. Kind of a curly brace version of comments, if you will. Yeah, sure. Java will do both of those as well. What's that? Java does both of those as well. Uh, I would assume, you know, it's been a long time since I've been much, 
done much Java, so I don't remember on its commenting yeah, structure. So it does, you can use Java. All right, so yeah, in Java, if you if you're familiar with Java, C plus plus is remarkably similar, and vice versa. That uh, Java definitely borrows a huge amount syntactically from C plus plus. All right, I'm gonna. Yeah, I'll leave that. Well, no. Okay. Uh, so now what I want to do is talk about one more variable type just briefly. Uh, there's a, something called a Boolean, just like you would say integer or float. It's a type. Note that the highlighting makes it green. My bar. My other var. Okay, they can only take one of two values. True or false? Uh, yes, so let me talk about true and false just a little bit more. Uh, the C language does not have a formal value type for Boolean. Bool, there's no such thing as Bool. Uh, what's the C language used for truth determining whether something was true or false was to ask a simple question. Is it equal to zero? And this is true in C++ as well. And it, it's rife in C++. So, in the language, in, I'll say C++, it's true of C. If the number is zero, then it is false. Anything else and I mean anything else is true. Okay. False. True. Why? Because Todd is not zero. It's that simple. All right. Now, uh, what I want to do is introduce the if statement, and the syntax for it is, so I'm going to use my C style comment here, syntax for if statement. If, Boolean expression, uh, statement. Incidentally, you see Vim as being very helpful by putting these asterisks here. These have absolutely no significance with regards to this multi-line comment. The only reason it's this way is over decades of using this multi-line comment, it's found to be visually pleasing to have these asterisks come down here. But as far as the compiler is concerned, that's all it's looking at, the beginning and ending of a comment. Okay, so just making that clear. Uh, so the syntax for an if statement is if this parenthesis, so the I, the F, the opening parenthesis, the closing parenthesis, is all part of the, lack of a better term, the hard-coded syntax that's required. And what it does is it evaluates this expression and it asks, is this true? And if it's true, it does statement. It's that simple. So, let's try it. If my var, see out, um, okay. Is my var true? Yes, so it's gonna it's gonna do the C out here. We can test that. And there it is. Let's try my other var. That's false, yes? So I should not see pure aisle. Uh, my others, other. And you'll notice there is no pure aisle here. So it's that simple. Now this is, this is pretty uninteresting because we all, when I compile the program, you know exactly whether or not this is going to occur. Where this actually becomes useful and exciting is when this decision is made while the program is running. 
So let me give you a, a trivial example. I'm going to create an integer called x, and I'm going to say C out, give me a number, C in, and I'm going to put that into x, and then I'll ask a question. If x, puerile. Yes? Um, in Java, you have to put the uh, curly braces around, like put around the if statements there, so you do that. Right. So the question is about curly braces in this if statement. I will get there. Okay. So let me compile this. I'm going to run it. Give me a number three. Is three true? Puerile. 42. Puerile. Zero. No puerile. Okay. So here's an example of us not knowing what it's going to do until the program's running. Um. All right, I'll use it as in a sentence. Let's try it again. I compile it. Don't forget to compile. It's always edit, compile, run. Edit, compile, run. Everyone at some point in the semester is going to fall into the trap of edit, run, edit, run. Why is it my code changing? Because you're forgetting to compile and you're running some old thing that you compiled yesterday, right? Never forget to compile. All right, A dot out. Give me a number. Three. Puerile, that was a puerile excuse. Let's try it again. 42. Puerile, that was a puerile excuse. Zero. What happened? It's still there. Is everything there? Is there anything missing? Right. All right. Let's look at our code. Looks like I have it written correctly. Let's look at how I describe the if statement. If. If it's true, then I'm going to do the statement following the if. Remember me talking about how the spacing is all for the convenience of us, the human reader? Let me change this. Is that a little more readable? So the if x on line 16 is only making the decision whether or not to run line 17. Line 18 has nothing to do with this if statement in the same sense that this has nothing to do with that if statement. Yes? So if you wanted that second statement to be part of the if. Yeah. Would you put if x again? Uh, right. So you could. You could do this, and that would work. However we can do something even better, which is take advantage of the fact that I said wherever you put can put a single statement, you can also put curly braces. And the minute I do this, now the if operates on everything inside the curly braces. Oh, this is this is me lecturing you on uh, all things C plus plus. So, right, this is just a comment. I'm not I'm not defining anything in the language. I, I'm just uh, this is just my commentary saying, hey, this is the way C plus plus works. So C plus plus works such that uh, if this evaluates to zero, it's considered false. Anything else is considered true. And now if I do it, zero, now I don't get any of them, OK? And you'll see, if you ever look at the way different uh, constructs in the language are described, there are many constructs that, that have some sort of expression up here, and then it operates on a single statement. And you just use that same axiom. Anywhere you can have a single statement, you can have a block of statements, in which case this would be connected to the entire block. All right. Uh, let's, in the final few minutes, let's make this a little more complex. I'm going to create a, a second variable, y. I'm going to copy that there. Give me another number, and I'm going to put that into y. 
In fact, I'll say I'm getting y here, I'm getting x here, just so that when we see that, we know it's happening. What I want to do is this time, I want to do this code if x is true or y is true. All right? So I could say 0 for x, but as long as I say 3 for y, one of them's true, so it'll do it. The C++ version of or are two pipes. And if you're unaccustomed to where the pipe is, this vertical bar, it is in the upper right-hand corner just below your delete key. Your shift backslash is going to be your pipe character. And I'll put a little comment here. Pipe pipe means or. So if x is true or y is true. Let's try that. Run it. Give me number 0, 3. This one was true, so it prints this stuff. Let me say 0 for both of them. Is x true or is y true? Nope, neither of them are true, so it's not going to do it. Normally where you see these uh, are in really things that are more complex. Give me a large number. Give me a small number. Well, what do you think is a large number? I'm thinking 10 is pretty large. If you're like a toddler, 10 is a large number. Okay. If x is greater than 10, or, or excuse me, I'll give you a different one. What do you think that means? Yes. If x is greater than 10 and y is less than, what's a small number? 0 is a small number. So if y is less than 0, then, and let's make this a little more informative. I'm tiring of my own humor here. All right. Uh, then we'll just say C out, X is large and Y is small. Okay, so for X to be large, it has to be greater than 10. For Y to be small, it has to be less than zero. So we'll compile it. Give me a large number, 50. Give me a small number, negative 3. X is large and Y is small. Let's try it again. X is a large number, however, Y I'm choosing 3, which is not very small, so it doesn't print anything. What if we, let's introduce a final concept to this if statement. Let me come up here. Else, so if it's true, it's going to do this one. If it's false, it's going to do this one. else. <coughs> Either x is small or y is large. Or maybe both. Okay, so the key idea here is I'm adding another word else. Compile it. Give me a large number, 50, native, uh, let's say, we'll say 50 for both of them. And then it says either x is small or x is large, or maybe both. Yes? Uh, a little sidebar. Do we have to put the semicolons at the end of the parameters? <coughs> the, oh, yeah, the semicolon, very good. Note that there is no semicolon right here. So not the parameters, no semicolon. No semicolon. No, there's no, the only where place you're going to see a semicolon are after these normal everyday statements. There's no semicolon after the else. Uh, in fact, this is a huge error right here. Putting, I'll talk more about this later, but that is a huge error because you know what that's the equivalent of? Let me copy and paste that down here to highlight it. By me doing this, so I want to say blah if this whole thing is true. The way the compiler sees it is like this. That is what is called an empty statement. It's a legal statement. You can do it in the language. 
So it's saying if this is true, then I'm going to do this nothingness. And then this is not connected with the if at all, and it happens all the time. And you can't figure out why when this is clearly false, it's printing blah. And the reason is because you've typed it in like this, and your eyeballs are telling you that blah is part of that if statement when it isn't, because that semicolon is sitting right there. Do not put a semicolon right there. Okay? Everything, all this code, I'm posting, yes. All right. Well, Assignment three is posted as well. Is that the thing, not